I want to welcome you and thank our candidates today for participating in this important discussion of critical issues that are important to the business community and to San Antonio. We also want to thank the University of Texas San Antonio for allowing us the use of these facilities. They've served very well and for partnering with us so that we can ha have these events here at UTSA. I also want to thank and take a moment to thank Telemundo, who is also our partner in the City Council Forums. Uh, with us today we have news anchor Alex Hernandez, who will be our moderator. So I'll give you a little bit about Alex and then we're going to hand the, the show over to him and we'll get started. <clears throat> Alex was born here in San Antonio. He's a graduate of Lee High School. His career in media began in 1999 as a radio and television voice personality. After graduating from UTSA with a major in general business, he became a full-time on-air personality for Spanish radio media outlet, and after a few years was named operations manager for Radio Formula, a news talk format uh, targeting Mexican nationals in the San Antonio area. His experience in TV includes Univision as a sports anchor, where he covered the World Cup in 2010. In 2013, he moved to Telemundo, where he is currently a news anchor for the 4.30, 5, and 10 p.m. shows. Please welcome our anchor, Alex Hernandez. Well, thank you very much. We're going to hand it over to you, and you're ready to go. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, candidates, good morning. Thank you for being with us today. And, uh, well, to get started, this morning, uh, I will ask uh, each candidate to give a, give a one-minute statement as an introduction where you can pretty much uh, tell us a, a little bit about yourself so we can learn about uh, your ideas, who you are, where you're from. And uh, we will we'll start today with uh, District uh, 3. Uh, here with us, candidate uh, Roy Aguino, and we'll start with you. Well, good morning. My name is Roy Aguillon, and I'm running for City Council out in District 3. I was born and raised in District 3, uh, went through the Harlandale Independent School District, went to high school at McCullum's prestigious Leadership Academy, and post that went to William Penn University out in Iowa. Uh, I was there for two years, and on my third year, I got the opportunity to work on President Obama's re-election campaign, and so I took that opportunity. Uh, post the campaign, I worked for the Democratic Party at along with a number of other candidates. Uh, and when that was all over, I started my own company, and we focus on political technologies, helping campaigns, nonprofits, and businesses run more efficiently using software and hardware. Uh, that company is centered here in District 3, uh, and I am hoping that during my time as a council person, uh, we can help small businesses grow and recruit new businesses into District 3. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, you and uh, we'll continue with the uh, increment and current councilwoman, Rebecca Villagran. You have one minute. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Rebecca Villagran. I am the current city councilwoman for District 3, representing the south and the southeast side of San Antonio, elected in 2013. Uh, my family has over 200 years in the San Antonio area, born and raised in the district. Therefore, I understand the needs of the community. I earned my Bachelor's of Science from Texas State University and my Master's of Public Administration from St. Mary's University. Uh, I went to Providence High School as well here in San Antonio. I'm currently a small business owner. Uh, my family has had the business since 1986 in District 3, Alamo Awards and Trophies. And professionally, I um, also was an adjunct professor at St. Mary's University served as a council aide to Robert Marva and Bonnie Connor, and um, also worked government relations and leadership development with the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. It's been an honor to serve. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll move on to District 4 with uh, Incommit and current councilman, Ray Sada. Have one minute. Sure. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here. Uh, uh, I'd like to start by saying, uh, I was born and raised in District 4, been in District 4 all my life, and I uh, uh, got into this business of the City Council when I was 24, and that was four years ago, and so now I'm 28, and I have four years' experience. The youngest on the Council, but probably at this point, I'm one of the most experienced on the Council. Started before that, I was at, um, I was at Stanford University, where I got my undergraduate and graduate degree, finished up there. Uh, came down to San Antonio. I worked as a adjunct professor at Trinity University at Palo Alto College and uh, here at UTSA. 
um, currently working for Kitt Public Schools, but uh, I've been working in the district to double the green space, work on infrastructure around schools, and, and ensure that you know this is a people business, so ensuring that people are safe and that uh, their neighborhoods uh, are safe as well. Thank you very much, Councilman Saldana, and uh, we'll stay with District 4 with uh, candidate Genevieve. Good morning. Thank you for uh, inviting me to your facilities. Um, born and raised in uh, District 4. Uh, I'm also a Southland graduate from 1978. Uh, attended Palo Alto College, uh, getting my bachelor's on sociology. Uh, currently, I'm a civil rights leader for the South of Bear County. My uh, passion is immigration reform and sanctuary and people. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, well, uh, also candidate Manuel Lopez informed us that he wouldn't be able to be uh, with us this morning. He had previously confirmed that he was uh, going to attend, but uh, he canceled. So we'll get started, and uh, we'll just remind the candidates of uh, today's uh, rules, if we can call them that, right? Uh, each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer uh, every particular question. And at the end of the forum, uh, each one will have a two-minute closing arguments. Okay, so we'll start with pre previously selected the first uh, question, and it's going for District 3 for Mr. Amir. You're right, sir? Yes. Let's get started. Very good. And this is about city government. San Antonio has established a city council manager form of government, as you know. Do you support Cheryl Scully as our current city manager? I think whenever a city has a AAA bond rating, you've got to say that there are some steps that have been taken uh, to make sure that we are in a very stable place. So for that, I'm appreciative of the city manager. However, when it comes to the police negotiation and the fire safety negotiations, uh, I think that the tone that has been taken by the city manager has been counterproductive to the conversation. And so uh, while I believe she deserves credit, for keeping us in a steady place financially. Uh, I also believe that there is room for growth in the way that we handle public safety debates. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll continue with uh, Councilwoman Yagran. Councilwoman, um, is this council manager form of government best for San Antonio? I believe that right now, we um, one of the biggest things is our city budget and how we manage our city and the growth. We are financially in a very good spot as, as a city and with our AAA bond rating as was shared. And because of that, we have the city manager, Cheryl Scully, to thank for that. And I do believe that the relationship between a city manager, Cheryl, and a mayor and council requires a lot of trust. And I'm happy that I have a good working relationship with her, and I plan on continuing that working relationship. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go with District 4, and the first question is uh, going for Genevieve Trinidad. Uh, we're going to stick with city uh, government. Um, how would you approach your relationship with Cheryl Scott? Well, um, everyone has to understand that I'm not here on my own behalf. I'm here on the people's behalf. Our voters, our community, our families. And while I've been block walking, all I hear is, uh, what's up with the city manager, Cheryl Scully? Why is she uh, wasting our money? Why is, does she want to raise taxes? You know, um, they see the, the neglect or um, the waste of funds, and they're just <coughs> uh, I have no problem uh, working with her as a team. I've reached out to other councils members sitting here uh, working on other issues and concerns that affects District 4, not only District 4, but the surrounding uh, south of Bear County. Thank you very much. Mr. Saldana, would you agree? Do you support Cheryl Scully as your current city manager? Sure, absolutely. I mean, there, there is, the city of San Antonio is in an enviable position, and, and it has been for the last seven years, including the fact that we went through this country went through one of the deepest recessions that uh, we have in our modern time. So I will have you just remember three numbers, 1,503. So 
in 2007, when Cheryl Scully was recruited to come to San Antonio, in that time, we had to reduce our city's civilian population or civilian workers by 1,000 people. Um, that wasn't easy to do, but what that was done, it, not why that was done, because of the necessity uh, to balance our city's budget without raising taxes. And we haven't raised taxes uh, in her tenure. And in fact, the second number, 500, is the amount of police and fire we've added in her tenure here. And the last is street, which is our AAA bond rating. And she's not only accomplished that in the first year she was here, but maintained that over, the, over her tenure. So she is a great city manager. And we should be lucky that we have a city manager after she is done with her tenure here in San Antonio that will do just as good enough of a job. She's not an elected official. That's why the city county for, or the manager council form of government works because she's a professional who knows and understands uh, fiscal budgets, making sure your trash gets picked up on time, our animals are picked up, and that we're expanding our green space and we're able to pass bonds for some of our bigger infrastructure projects throughout the city. Okay. I'd like to hear from uh, Jimmy that. What would you have to say about that? Do you agree? Disagree? I disagree uh, only because I've been block walking and I have that connection. I'm also grassroots and uh, I see the dogs all the time. That's, I mean, when I was block walking recently, that's the main concern right now. The the animals, uh, they just get in dumped. The weeds, the uh, tearing down of uh, our culture, uh, like our hemisphere. Um, also, I, I'm, I know that they're going to be, be bringing up the, about the walls of the Villita, that there's some of the tourists want that brought down as well. And a lot of, uh, I feel that we need a city manager that is uh, connected to our people, so far as our traditions and our culture. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll move back to district number three. We'll move uh, to another topic, infrastructure and water. Councilwoman Villagran, I would uh, start with you. San Antonio, as you know, is committed to uh, investing a significant amount of money to funding the Vista Ridge water pipeline. We're talking about 142 mile water pipeline with the intention of expanding our water supply and securing additional water supplies for the city. As a city council member, do you support, support this project? I believe securing our water, I know how important securing our water is for our future is now. And that is why I support, I voted in support of the Vista Ridge uh, water pipeline. I also know that other plans that we are having, like our desalinization plant that we broke ground in, is another way to diversify our water source. And I enjoy uh, having a strong working relationship with our SAWS um, president and our SAWS board of trustees. So I believe that um, moving forward with our water security is, is important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Candidates, I'll remind you, we have 90 seconds to answer every question. So we're doing good on time. Don't be scared to use all your time. Uh, candidate uh, Aguillon, the same uh, question for you. Uh, do you support the current financial commitment and the corresponding rate uh, increase for this uh, project that has on taxpayers? Uh, in Texas, the competition for water resources is only going to grow. And the assets that we are uh, getting in Vista Ridge today, we are paying pennies on the dollar what we would in the future. And so for me, it's a no-brainer to take it now because the assets that we're purchasing are only going to go up in value. They will not go down. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Salania, we will, we will stick with the same question. As a city council member, do you support this project? and other projects to increase water capacity. Yes, absolutely. There is no doubt in my mind that in the state of Texas, one of the most competitive things that you could do is secure your water supply for, you know, for you, for your residents, and for the businesses that rely on that water to function. Um, one only needs to look at a, a state like California who's going through significant drought issues and in San Antonio or in Texas. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of times when people are actually selling water. Uh, I think that the biggest uh, advantage that we put ourselves in in purchasing the water and securing an agreement with the Vista Ridge Pipeline is that we will be able to outpace Austin, who is still struggling to figure out how do they, how do they secure their water supply for a growing population. We're in a fortunate position that the city is growing and it's growing quickly, but we, in the same way that we need to handle tra transportation issues, uh, employment issues, we need to secure our water supply. So uh, the Vista Ridge Pipeline is an investment in our future at the same time. Um, what that means is there are rates that we as residents have to pay to make to, to accomplish that long-term 
uh, debt obligation, uh, we know that we have residents who even today struggle to pay their, their, their water bills, and so it's important that uh, we take care of them with programs like uh, affordability programs, Project Iowa, Plumbers to People, especially when you represent a blue collar community like you do, on, like I do on the south side. Um, so you have to balance really the future of the city's growth and our ability to keep water prices low and, and taking care of people today. Thank you very much. Candidate uh, Trinidad, uh, just uh, heard from Councilman Saldana, what's your opinion about it? I disagree on this project. I feel that you know, $80 million for this project is just not feasible. Why don't we just use our money and bring it back and keep it in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, invest in our aquifer, Edwards aquifer and uh, the aquifer's protection and build around that and continue to, uh, you know, uh, spread it around San Antonio. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Aguillon, we'll continue with you, sure. Let's talk about the city charter. One uh, particular city charter proposal for San Antonio voters to decide in May is whether city council members should be paid for their service. Do you support pay for our city council members? So for me, and this is just my personal opinion, uh, public service is public service. Uh, I'm not motivated for this office with the idea of a paycheck. I'm running because I want to help out my community. Now that's just my personal opinion, and I don't think that I have a monopoly on good ideas. So whatever voters decide, I'll listen to. But for me personally, I believe that public service should be public service, so I'll be voting no to that charter reform. Thank you. Councilwoman, you're currently a councilwoman, so uh, what's your take on it? I'm, ex I'm very happy that we are moving forward to putting this to uh, the charter referendum, to bring this to the voters to, um, for mayor and council compensation. I do believe this is one of the reforms that needs to take place because uh, as we shared in past uh, council conversations that we've had, this charter was written at a very different time in, uh, in the 50s. And I'll let my council colleague uh, Saldana share a little bit more about the history because he says it so eloquently about even at the time when we were paying a poll tax. It was also at large districts and it was also uh, designed in a different way. So now, as we move forward with the city charter reform, I think the times are different. We represent somewhere between 120 and 140,000 people in every district. And we want to make sure that we have all of our time devoted there, but also make sure that we, as citizens, as residents, as servants, can provide that time at 7.30 in the morning, until 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. in the evening. We are there and accessible seven days a week. And so that compensation, I think, is also a fair and just way to move forward with this. So I will be supporting it. Okay. Thank you very much. It's good to hear from current uh, council's uh, members as well. And uh, we'll move on with Councilman Saldana as well. Uh, do you believe, Councilman, that council pay will change the dynamic of who will run, actually, for city council? Sure, absolutely, and I'll start there. It will absolutely change the, the, the character of the folks who, who can decide to actually do this. This is a question about access to service, access to the city council. Um, it, there's no doubt in my mind the conversation will change with folks that I talked to today, and I asked them you know, if they would be interested at some point in the future on, with serving the city council. Well, if they have two children, they have a mortgage, they have car payments, uh, they have student loan bills, there is a sign on city halls that says do not apply um, because you can't take that level of sacrifice in most cases for your family or for your spouse or your loved one. There is no doubt in my mind that the charter was written to, in the way it was to keep certain people from running for office, those who are not independently wealthy. Um, and so it, it has changed the dynamic. From 1951 when it was written, the city was 200,000 people. Now 200,000 people makes up one district. So back in that time, it was a part-time position. And so $1,000 a year might actually buy you a vehicle in 1951. We're in 2014, and we still have issues with access to the seat because you know, this is not about myself getting paid. You know, I've gone through four years of not paid. Um, this is about future persons who are in my position who can take this seat in 60, 70 hours a week at a public service position and not have to tell their 
their, their family, their children, that they cannot, they can no longer bring in any source of income. So the, the, bar, the bar is way too high for, for folks for this to be actually a position that is accessible to all people. Thank you very much, Councilman. Uh, and today, bring you that, would you accept pay as Councilman? No. My, my thing is this. Uh, I put my name on the ballot to give the people a choice. Now, if you take that choice away from our people, um, just because they don't have a high standard of living or a degree or money to run for office, what does that leave us? The, pe the families that we're supposed to represent. If I want a job, I can go get a job, a 9 to 5 job, any job. I know this is public service. It's a passion. It's for my people, San Antonio, City of San Antonio, District 4. And to get paid is, it's not, it's not um, acceptable to me. It's just taking out the whole passion of running and serving. It's public service. So I say no. Candidates, I will uh, remind you just to speak uh, directly to the microphone so everybody can hear you loud and clear. Um, Councilwoman Villagran will uh, continue with another topic, topic that's being uh, well all throughout the media, talking about fire and police issue, and uh, we'll go with that. Uh, the city's public safety functions are you know, supported by the city's general fund. This fund also supports other key functions, such as libraries, parks, street repairs, and code enforcement. Alone, the public safety departments constitute the largest general fund expenditures in the city's budget, which has well, resulted in fewer funds being available for the city needs. Do you support the city's negotiations to reduce police and fire department benefits that will limit those expenditures to no more than 66% of the city's budget? Thank you. Um, what, what I was sharing earlier is the city budget is um, one of our, the city budget is our, our policies quantified. And one of our biggest public policies that we move forward that we hear as priority is our public safety. So moving forward, one of the biggest components for that is we need to make sure that when we move forward that our police and our fire are respected and that we have a well-funded and resourced public safety um, priority in our, in our city budget. That is why moving forward, I think what I, I did, I signed the CCR to withdraw the lawsuit in order to move negotiations forward. And negotiations did move forward. The city sat at the table with the police department, with the SAPOA, and they have had those negotiations moving forward. I'm hoping that we can get to the point where we can come to an agreement together. Um, and I know that our contract negotiations are a huge element of our city budget. And I believe that as we move forward, we need to make sure that our police and fire are respected for the job that we do, and also that we have the human resource, the officers needed, as we grow as a, a large city here. And that's going to take a lot of conversation. So I'm looking forward to that. I, I, I am not in agreement with some of the things, some of the ways that we did move forward, the negotiation process, but I'm glad that they did go to the table. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll move on with candidate Aguillon. Mr. Aguillon, do you uh, agree with the way the city council has uh, handled the negotiations for the fire and police departments? No, and I think that one of the best ways to show public safety that we were in support of them would have been to not let the lawsuit advance in the first place. The lawsuit that we have right now uh, that we're fighting uh, against the Evergreen Clause has cost us nearly a million dollars, and it has, according to a, another council person, less than a 5% chance of actually doing anything. So if this is just a leveraging tool, I can't imagine as a small business owner ever suing the other person on the other side of the table and trying in any realm of the possibility thinking that that would be a good option. And so for me, one of the first things I would do is make sure that we uh, pulled back that lawsuit and negotiated in good faith with police and fire. Thank you very much. 
We'll stick with the same subject. Subject, uh, Councilman uh, Villagran. Uh, do you support the city? Saldana, I'm sorry. Did you, do you support this? Uh... Sure, yeah. So um, if you want to know what a city cares about, it's very easy. You look at their city budget and you figure out exactly where they're putting their value. So if you look at our city's budget, we've actually established a policy that 66% of our budget should go to police and fire. No doubt, if you pick up the phone and call any resident, they would say the most important thing is keeping my neighborhood, myself, my family safe. So we have made a strong commitment to public safety. The question is, you know, is there going to be an elected body and mayor who is going to step up to say, look, if we continue growing beyond 66%, we will be put in a position where we will be paying more for police and fire, uh, health care benefits, for equipment, and trust me, we pay a significant portion of our general fund budget. We'll be paying so much that it'll be crowding out other things that all that resident that you call also cares about. They want their parks maintained. They want their libraries open. They want more animal care officers and code compliance officers on the streets. So if you don't have a city council or mayor who's willing to step up and say there are some changes that we need to make here, uh, then you will find yourself in 10 years having a more difficult time balancing your budget. So we're saying to our police and fire during the negotiations, will you consider, like a lot of other San Antonians, like a majority of this country, uh, sharing in the cost of health care? That is what's on the table. It's my prediction in the next month and a half, you know, once all the white noise clears, it's going to be very clear that what we're trying to do is not even have the uniformed officer who bears the risk, who is in a difficult position as a police and fire officer, pay premiums, but we'd ask for the them to share in the cost of health care for their dependents, for their family members. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Thing, uh, do you support the city council's um, option to reduce the department benefits? Unfortunately, <clears throat> I feel that our current mayor and the majority of the council have failed our firefighters and our police officers, to tell you the truth. You know, they, they risk their lives every day. They put their lives every day, their health, uh, the expectancy to live, uh, you know, once they enter the fire, I'm talking about the firefighters, with the increase of cancer and health issues, uh, I feel that we need to give them 100% support in their health benefits. Thank you, Thank you very much. Let's talk uh, a little bit about sports. It's, uh, Throughout the years, we've been wanting a professional uh, football team, or even now, soccer team. So we'll start with you, uh, Mr. Sergeant Young. Would you uh, support uh, taxpayer dollars to promote the recruitment and relocation of a professional football or soccer team to the season? So that's a pretty broad question. Uh, if it's spending a couple hundred bucks, so that way we can put out a spread and they can come and visit with us, that's fine. But when you're talking about spending millions of dollars on a taxpayer-funded uh, stadium, I think that that's unacceptable. We've seen this time and time again in city after city after city, the same mistake is made. To, in order to lure a professional sports team to an area that spends millions upon millions of dollars, and then the sports team never generates the kind of jobs that they said they would. They don't put back into the economy the type of money they said that they would. And so for me, that's a mistake I would hope that we would avoid and that we would learn from other cities uh, from the missteps that they've made. Okay. Councilwoman? Yes, um, we have had this story before, of course, with um, luring uh, professional football teams to San Antonio with hopes and, and ideas, etc. cetera. Uh, one thing that we as a city, I believe, need to do um, as we move forward is to make sure that we do put our um, best foot forward in making packages available to know because we are a championship caliber city. We um, have had championship games, final fours in the past year. People enjoy coming to San Antonio. Now has that translated to um, major league soccer, major league football, or national league football? Oh, that hasn't happened yet. But if there is going to be a tax funded stadium, I believe one, that the tax um, that we need to have more conversation about that. And two, I believe that we have an opportunity right now with Major League Soccer, um, with different partners coming and moving forward. But we should be very diligent and do our utmost research and um, make sure that we are not giving away everything to one 
corporation or one team. We need to have a lot of conversation before we move forward. But do I think San Antonio deserves another major league um, for sports? Absolutely, I do. Councilman, I think, uh, well, the Alamo Dome stands as a previous example of the uh, city's effort of bringing a professional football team to the city. Um, what's your take on it? I think the approach to, you know, San Antonio is a major league city. It does deserve major league soccer or major league football. The, the ultimate decision should not be the city council. I think it should be the voters. And so if you wanted to build uh, a stadium for the San Antonio Raiders or the San Antonio Rams, uh, you'd have to ask the city residents if you could have the permission to do those things. Uh, but we believe that there is a position in some time in the future uh, in which San Antonio will be able to benefit from an NFL expansion team and not have to compete in the way that it did for the Oakland Raiders, because that is a movement of one city to another. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we will coordinate team uh, for if they are interested in San Antonio, but we will not spend major uh, taxpayer dollars unless we have the permission uh, to a citywide vote. And I think that if you took this to a citywide vote, there'd be a real appetite uh, for folks to want to put together a package for an NFL team and case it would be perhaps a sales tax. So if you are spending money here as a tourist, you're spending money here as a resident, that sales tax that you pay uh, would go potentially into the building uh, of that state in the same way that they did for the Alamo Dome. Thank you. Ms. Lindyvap, do you believe the city of San Antonio needs uh, another professional team? No. We need to stop uh, wasting our money. And any monies or projects, uh, we need to stop. We need to uh, uh, continue in infrastructure fix what is broken within our communities and our families, bringing in teams or building another dome, maybe down the future, but for right now, our families in our communities in District 4 and south of San Antonio, we need a lot of fixing and repair in our communities with our parks, sidewalks, uh, and parts, some of our parks don't even have running water. I mean, why don't we just stop wasting money and bring that money into our community and into our families and generate jobs and growth in our in our communities within our family. Thank you very much. We'll uh, switch topics here, and uh, we'll talk about the um, uh, Alamo. Not the Alamo Dome, but the Alamo. The Alamo is a historical shrine for San Antonio, our state, and also our nation. As a member of uh, City Council, would you support the funding and actions necessary to restore the current site to more accurately reflect? reflect its original configuration. Council. Thank you. So I understand the importance of uh, the Alamo uh, to our story of our city, of our state, of our country, and our, our nation. Um, my family is a direct lineage descendant of Toribio Lozoya, one of the defenders of the Alamo. So we understand the importance of telling the whole story. With that said, I believe that if we can come to a consensus on the vision with respect, with respecting the businesses and the property owners of the area of what that could look like, if we can come to a consensus with that, I think we have a lot of opportunity moving forward. Um, I know we are in conversations right now looking for a um, master plan development of the area. This area needs to be free and open to our community. So we can tell the story, not just of the Battle of the Alamo, but the story before the battle, and the story of the people of the area, and make it a walkable area as well. So I think that's very important as we move forward. Thank you very much. Candidate Aggie John, would you support the necessary property and business acquisition to complete such reconstruction. The last thing uh, in the toolbox should be uh, something like forcing business owners out of the area. I think our first step would always be trying to work with the property owners and trying to work with the business owners to find ways to respect and honor the story of the Alamo because it's the story of Texas. And so for me, that's not my first choice. It's the absolute last measure we take if we're trying to respect the Alamo and respect the story of the Alamo. Thank you very much. Councilman Saldana, same question for you. Sure. So 
there is a situation now where folks who visit the city, visit, visit the Alamo specifically, will, will come here from all over the country and uh, spend a few minutes looking at the Alamo. And, um, and then they will look around themselves and say that this is, uh, this is not what I expected. Um, and I think that's the same idea that a lot of folks have when they start thinking about, is there a change that you could make to the Alamo to really respect its heritage and its history and its place in our city? And um, they've looked around, they've seen some businesses that don't necessarily coincide with that history. There was not a Ripley's, believe it or not, in 1836. Um, nevertheless, you, you need to pos position yourself uh, not as just the city making this decision, but also the state. The state is very involved in conversations about how we might be able to re-envision uh, what that area looks like. So you're not pushing, I, you, you, I, I don't believe you'll ever get to a position where you're pushing a business out. Uh, so you're going to have to compensate these businesses for a very valuable spot. That is, that is not going to be cheap, which is why you don't go this alone. Um, and you're going to need the state to kick in uh, probably for a proposition in which you amortize uh, over maybe 10 years or over 15 years for those businesses to have them recoup what they would have made, but eventually uh, move them to a more appropriate place that is not in front of, uh, in front of the Alamo. So if you want to respect the city's history, you need to be able to do so in a way that is delicate to current businesses that exist, um, and you do it in partnership uh, with the state. So I believe that the state will be coming forward with a proposition to help, help us do that, but um, I don't have a crystal ball, that would be my prediction. Okay, thank you very much. that, would you agree with uh, Councilman Saldani? What's your take on I don't agree. I remember as a child when uh, we used to go to the Alamo, and I have great memories of, uh, you know, uh, the knife and the concrete and the historical uh, history within the walls and what have you. And as an adult, I went to visit the Alamo, um, and it was not, but it, it was just hurtful to see how it's become more of a business instead of a culture, a traditions, and part of history. So um, I believe in the upkeep and the upgrades, yes, but to continue to uh, Make it a business? No. Thank you very much. Let's talk about John Creech. <coughs> Interesting subject. Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Yon. Uh, San Antonio will continue to grow, as you know, at a record pace as a result of new businesses and job creation. Do you believe that tax incentives provide, uh, by, provided by the city should be used to attract prospective companies? Absolutely. So my platform has been created, trying to create middle class jobs in District 3. In our district, middle class jobs are the closest thing to a silver bullet that we have to curing a lot of our ills. Middle class jobs, when they come into an area, allow uh, for the residents in that area to have more disposable income and to achieve home ownership at a quicker rate. And that, at the end of the day, is the best way to build equity. And so in District 3, if we create middle class jobs by offering tax incent uh, incentives, land grants, and a number of other tools. Those are things that I want to make sure that we're taking a look at. But in District 3, we've got uh, a lot of great potential for middle class jobs to move into the area. And so, absolutely, tax incentives are one of the tools in the toolbox to uh, try to recruit new business out there. Councilwoman, same question. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yes, uh, tax incentives, I think they are helpful. And District 3 has had a lot of great success uh, in these past two years with that. A great example is just Holt Cat that's made their announcement that they are planning on retaining and expanding their corporate headquarters in District 3, um, 85,000 square feet. So that is another example of how we are bringing, how we have jobs available and we are making sure that they are here. Um, but we also need to make sure when we use these tax incentives, when we bring them as a city, that we need to ensure that they create economic and they foster economic growth and that the city does our due diligence to hold these companies accountable that they are meeting all of those benchmarks that they need to meet in order to get these tax abatements and incentives. I believe we know here um, that we have many jobs available in this city. We need to make sure that our workforce, to, that our workforce is, has the proper skills and the development in order to fill those jobs that we have available. So um, yes, we've had a lot of success with this, and I'm looking forward to make sure that we have um, as we have them as we move forward. Thank you, Genevieve. Uh, do you support taxes incentives? 
for companies? Um, no. If they want to come to San Antonio and uh, start their own business or generate business, uh, they should be, uh, this is a great opportunity, but also give back to our families and to our communities. Um, why should we have to be giving them tax incentives? It should be the other way around. They're, they're asking us to come into our city to generate businesses and what have you. So I, I would just disagree. <coughs> so the, the city of San Antonio competes nationally with, uh, with every, whether it's, it's Seattle, whether it's Orlando, um, it, it is Charlotte, for jobs. And when you're approaching a competition with another city, it's important that you are able to compete with them. And so they're, so Dallas or Charlotte will offer tax incentives. They will offer tax abatements. And the city of San Antonio needs to compete with that. Uh, the stipulation that we make is that if you want to come to San Antonio and you want to take a tax abatement, uh, then you need to do a few things. You need to pay a living wage. Uh, you need to make sure that you are generating the type of, the amount of jobs you say. So two examples. Um, on the, on the great end, I live in a blue-collar community, I grew up in a blue-collar community. A lot of the folks uh, that are my neighbors now have benefited from employment at Toyota on the south side. So now they're able to afford a home and start a new life, enter the middle class in the same way that they were at Kelly Air Force Base. And so a job is security for a family. And they do so by creating good jobs like they did at Toyota or they did at Kelly Air Force Base on the military. The opposite end is uh, we don't provide tax incentives. We don't provide tax abatements for those who don't want to pay a minimum wage or a living wage. And the example is um, the Marushan noodle plant, just beyond the city's limits. The employees about 300, but they did not get city tax abatements or incentives because they weren't willing to pay uh, above a minimum wage or above a living wage. And so that's the competition in the world that we live in um, because it means jobs for our neighbors and our residents. Thank you very much. Councilman, I'll sit with you. And uh, the topic of uh, traffic congestion this morning. I was driving up to 410. It took me a while to get here. Uh, and this obviously has been a, a, a topic of a critical issue also for our economy. And uh, well, there are multiple solutions needed actually to address it. One of them being a proposed tollings as one of these transportation solutions for traffic congestion. Would you agree? Yeah, so I was I was running late today because of uh, this is the first time and everybody here is on the south side, so you're probably traveling either on 35 or 37. So uh, 35, as I was driving up, gave me the vision that I was coming south from 281 or 1604, and we're not there yet on the south side. We have significant congestion problems um, in certain park pockets of our city. Uh, if we don't get this right, and I, I'm talking about multimodal transportation, we're not going to be able to build extra lanes on our highways in order to relieve ourselves of congestion. So we need to have a multimodal approach. That means enhancing what happens at VIA, that means considering options like rail, uh, and that means uh, improving uh, uh, our infrastructure for highway access, and maybe even balancing how we live with our, for our growth. But uh, there have been options about whether toll roads is something that the city should use. Really. I don't have an appetite for it. Nobody in the city of San Antonio has an appetite for it because it doesn't exist. But if we get so bad that we are seeing what I saw along 35 today and you continue to see what happens at 1604 and 281, then folks like they did in Austin 10 years ago said, we just can't deal with this. Tell me what to pay and I'll pay it. You know, we don't want to get there in the city, so we need to, we, we need to expand uh, our, our vision to a more, more multimodal option where it includes public transit, includes rail, it includes uh, more efficient highway system. Um, so let's not get to that point, but uh, you know, really we shouldn't take anything off the table. Thank you very much. Just do that. Um, what do you think our options are to improve our traffic congestion? congestion in the city? Well, I say no to tow roads. Um, you know what? Get that money and bring it back into the communities, into the family. Currently, a lot on the south side of Bear, uh, Bear County and District 4. I mean, our roads need a lot of repair, a lot of work. And uh, because of the lack of uh, keeping up with our roads and our streets within the neighborhoods and the communities, um, that's why there's a lot of uh, potholes, uh, floodings, uh, congestion. Uh, and so I say no to tow roads. Councilman? Yeah. 
councilwoman? Do you support Coleman? Well, we need a 21st century multimodal transportation plan that will allow every San Antonio resident to participate in our growing economy. And I believe part of that is our work with VIA and Brooks. We're having our Brooks Transit Center, and so that is going to create options to use with multimodal. We need, um, we need to have a conversation about rail. And I, as, a, as, a, as city councilwoman, I'm glad to sit on the Lone Star Rail District to get people moving from rail from one part of the city to the other and up and along 35 if we need to. I believe that um, looking at toll roads should be a last resort as we move forward because we need more 21st century multimodal options and toll roads would have to be something at the very last resort that we look at. So it's not anything that I would advocate for now. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any young bigger cities like Houston, Dallas uh, have opted for uh, toll roads, even hub links? Uh, would you consider those as an option? No. For San Antonio? I would never consider a toll road as an option for San Antonio. Uh, I think Councilman said that he was right. There's not the appetite for something like that out there. While I do believe that we need uh, increased public transportation options, I just don't believe that toll roads are a fix to this. What options would you consider? I think one of the most efficient things you can do uh, is an expanded bike lane. And so when you look at how much you spend per dollar uh, on the different transportation options we have, when you spend one dollar personally uh, to use your bike, the taxpayer only spends eight cents. So uh, to give you a bit of a comparison, if you're using something like public transportation, whether it be bus, rail, or uh, some type of trolley system for every dollar that you spend there, a taxpayer spends 58 cents. And then when you talk about driving your own car, for every dollar you spend, a taxpayer spends four dollars, whether it be an upkeep of the roads, building of interstates. Uh, and so for me, when you look at that, uh, I think it's pretty easy to see that bike lanes are probably the best bang for our buck. Councilwoman, would you support this option? Well, I think as we look at our 21st century multimodal options, we have to look at all of our options, and we also have to look at the logistics and the and the reality. Um, riding a bike on a bike lane three miles into downtown San Antonio in June um, before you get to work, we have to look at those options as well. Um, but I think looking at that reality, we have to make sure that we have somewhere to go to change, to shower, to get ready to go to our job too. So to looking at it holistically as we move forward. But absolutely, keep everything on the table. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Candidates, we're doing great on time. I actually didn't think we were going to make it to the last questions. They're a little bit more district-related. Uh, we'll start with District uh, 4 with uh, <coughs> Councilman Saldana. Councilman, there are many concerns of uh, animals running loose in the area of Old Pearsall Road, Indian Creek subdivision. How are you doing to control, or what's it being done to control the growing population of stray animals on the streets? I'm glad to know you know the District 4 streets. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is, uh, the, the issue we have with, with stray animals is not, as I've said before, this is not a dog problem or animal problem, it's a people problem. And uh, we, could, we could hire more officers and pick up more, which, we, we, which we, we've tried as a strategy. Let's pick up more animals, it's double the amount of animals we've taken to the shelter. Um, that hasn't solved the problem. So what we've, not, we've, we've had to do in Indian Creek, is, and we started there as our pilot, is we actually had to knock on doors and talk to folks and give them two options. We said, we're going to come back here in a week with our animal care officers because, coming to this neighborhood specifically, because this is the, case, the area we get our calls about for bites and for strays. And so let's focus on the areas where the problem is highest, and let's go and knock on doors and tell folks that they've got two options. We're going to pick up their animals, uh, which is not never a good option, or um, we can have them do two things. They can have them spayed or neutered, they can have them cared for, and we don't just offer a, a problem without a solution. We've actually even put money towards this program to make sure that we're paying for spay and neuter. Uh, they were actually bringing the spay and neuter services to those neighborhoods. So across the, the neighborhood from, from, from uh, Indian Creek will actually do the spay and neuters in their neighborhood because some of our residents have never taken their dogs in their vehicles. So we're actually putting the, those at their fingertips to solve this problem, to get people uh, uh, to be part of the solution, and not just our animal care officers, and expanding the amount of animals that we have at our at our 
shelter because we don't want to be a city that is is euthanizing the most animals because we were there in 2004 and that is not the solution. Do you have anything to add? What would you propose as a solution? I don't think it's a people problem. I think it's it goes back to the city. The city is responsible uh, for this uh, department with our, our pets, our animals, our strays. So we need to look into see what's going on with the city employees and the departments that are running uh, these programs with our pets. I, I, I agree on the SNAP and the and the federal programs and what have you, but it's not a people problem. It goes back to the city. Very much. Now moving to District 3, Councilwoman uh, Villagran. Higher education is targeting minority students for STEM programs. How would you assist within the district to have students receive college tuition to study STEM programs at colleges and universities? Thank you. Um, one of the wonderful things that we have that is growing um, in District 3 right now is our footprint in higher education. I think many of you know this last year we are bringing the University of Incarnate Word Medical School to Brooks City Base. Not only that, now we have our pre-K for SA site in District 3 off of South New Braunfels. And then we have our University of the Incarnate Word Medical School right down the street from there. So we have four-year-olds now, people in District 3 who are going to be able to go through the system from four years old all the way to get their medical degree in District 3. How we're doing this and how we continue to do this is to create partnerships with our charter schools, with our school boards, and with our universities, and um, with Palo Alto College, with Texas A&M San Antonio, with the University of the Incarnate Word, and with the initiatives that our local school districts are working on, such as Harlandville has their early college um, STEM high school that is being built right across Memorial Stadium, and to continue to foster these, but not just in high school, but to start even early on. Let's look at our pre-K for SA. How can we, how can we do that? Let's look at our middle school students and continue to build on that. And working with, um, what are these uh, dual, college, um, dual college credits that we can work with the high schools as well to make sure that students, when they complete college, when they complete high school, graduate from high school, they can already be in their junior year in college. Thank you. Very grateful that Councilman Villagran mentioned the Harlandell. ISD Early College High School. Uh, that's one of the things that I was a leading advocate for as a member of the Bond Oversight Committee. Uh, I feel really proud that the district that I'm a product of now gives students the opportunity to, to graduate not only with a high school diploma but with an associate's degree. So once they leave, they go out into the world with two years of college already under their belt and they can get the other two uh, at, a, at a much less expense. And so Harlan ISD took some fantastic steps to give students a better choice and to give them more opportunity. And I hope that we can replicate that with school districts uh, in and around District 3. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, candidates, uh, those are all the questions for today. However, now we have two minutes for closing arguments. And we will begin with you, sir. Well, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to the Greater Chamber for inviting me to come on out and talk about my vision for uh, middle class job creation in District 3. Uh, it was really exciting to uh, be able to share my vision for District 3 and some of the ideas we have on very specific topics. So I'm appreciative of that. District 3 has a lot of potential. And I'm excited to be in the conversation and to be able to help lead the way uh, on some of the stuff that we've got coming to us. And so uh, I just wanted to say thank you for having me here today. and. Uh, Look forward to uh, keeping the conversation up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for uh, giving me this opportunity to be here with you this morning. And I also want to thank you for the opportunity to work with you and advocate with you uh, at SA to DC and other endeavors that we've worked on together. You know, since being elected in May 2013, I have worked with 18 different council members. And I was elected in May 2013. And what that means is that there is a need for consistency and certainty. And I bring that. I also bring the accomplishments that I have with working with companies in the district, such as Zachary Holdings, 
um, Toyota, Brook City Base, Holt Cat, just to name a few. But you know, there are still challenges ahead. We haven't even touched on um, securing our military mission and what we're going to talk about revising our UDC and our comprehensive plan. I bring this certainty and consistency to this role. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here and let you know that I will provide that strong, qualified, consistent leadership to this position and to all of the people of District 3 and the City of San Antonio. I thank you for the opportunity to serve and I look forward to continuing to serve and your support in the upcoming election. Thank you very much. Councilman Thank you once again for the Greater Chamber and hosting us here this this, uh, this morning. It is good as candidates for us to talk about issues that uh, deal with issues that are not just specific to our neighborhoods, but even as, has a citywide impact. So I'll, I'll take this opportunity to make a quick pitch for what I believe is going to be the next the next generation of San Antonio's growth, which is the South Side of San Antonio. I'll name just a few things. Uh, Texas A&M San Antonio is predicted to have close to 20,000 students by 2025. Also, in the 410 area, south of 410, just beyond Palo Alto College, uh, there is the completed work of the South Bear Sewer Pipeline. Uh, what that means is there's going to be tremendous opportunities for residential, single-family homes, businesses to develop out in the side of San Antonio. So my, my, my message would be do not sleep on San, San, San Antonio's south side. It is going to be the next generation of growth, the next generation of business, the next generation of jobs. And there are things that we have put in place over the last, since I've been in office of the last four years that are going to need to continue if we're going to make it an attractive place for people to live, to work, to raise a family. And those are things like doubling the amount of green space that we've got. We're turning what used to be the city's landfill into the city's largest park down at Pearsall Road. It's called Pearsall Park today. So we're also making investments in Military Drive, which is right outside the gates of Blackman Air Force Base, um, because that is the city's single largest employer. Uh, is our military. So when you put all these components together, the expansion of work in the aerospace industry happening at Port of San Antonio, you really get a lot going on on the city's south side, a lot going on in District 4 that we need to continue work for, uh, because that is an area where people should be looking towards developing, should be looking towards growing, and um, you know, we think we're in a good position uh, for the next five or ten years if we put in the work today to ensure a bright future for the city's south side. Okay, well, I want to thank every one of you for coming and for inviting me into your facilities. You have to understand that my passion comes through years of being an activist and listening to our people's cry. You know, when will we get change? When will something be done within our communities and our families? And. Um, that's where I'm coming from. That's why I'm, I'm putting my name in the ballot, representing our voters, our families. And I believe in change, but we've been neglected for so many uh, years. You know, um, our families deserve more. They deserve better on the south side of Bear County. I carry with me the passion of our people in District 4, in the city of San Antonio. And they're tired of being neglected. They're exhausted of voting for the same rhetoric, the same policies as usual. <coughs> they, they want change. They embrace change. But they're being neglected so far as, for example, our neighborhoods, streets, curbs, weeds. Uh, Mr. Saldana brought up about that part that what used to be a landfill. Um, there's a lot of uh, contamination in District 4, also on Leon, uh, Leon Creek. Contamination there on the water, there's sewage. Um, we need testing to be done. Our families deserve better than to live in contaminated dirt or play on contaminated soil. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all candidates for being here this morning. I think it's great for our community to hear from you, to hear from your vision, and particularly for the vision that you have for your particular district. Um, this time, we'll hear from the chamber to adjourn this event. Thank you.
Great. Wow, what a great discussion that we've had today. I hope that we have provided a forum for you to get any number of ideas, perspectives, of course the topics that were raised today, all very important to San Antonio and of course to the business community as well. So let's give our candidates a round of applause for all their time here today. We certainly also want to thank our partners in the event, the University of Texas San Antonio for use of their facilities, and of course Telemundo for our being our media partner for these forums. I want to let everybody know that our next forum will be held this Friday, April 10th, where we will be featuring Districts 5 and 8. We certainly hope to have you there as well so we can have a similar forum and, and learn from our candidates there and from hearing, of course, like we did today from our next city leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here and we are adjourned. <laughs>